And as you said, I'm Sam. Uh, that's my name. Uh, I'm here to tell you all about them artificial intelligences and the art they make. Um, I am getting over a bit of a cold, so I may sound nasally. If you can't hear me, just like shout and I'll try and like announce, an, enunciate, uh, or just heckle me the whole time too. That's fun. Um, I figured we'd start this out with a bit of a demo because who doesn't love the demo? Um, I just literally have stable diffusion running here. And so we can try some prompts to see what happens. Out of curiosity, how many people here have used like Dolly 2 or Dolly Mini or used like AI generation applications before for it? Okay, pretty decent number of people. Who here has never even like heard of any of those? Oh, wow. Okay, well, good. Okay, We're, I'm about to blow your mind. Uh, one of you who has never heard about this before, give me a sentence. Someone's in the chat. Uh, sorry, I can't see the demo. Oh, I apologize. Uh, you will just have to uh, be sad. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. Okay, on to my, hundred, my literal 100 slides. We're not, we're, no, no slowing down. Okay, so um, yeah, now to really blow your minds, I'm going to talk about Minecraft. Um, I did promise Minecraft. I'm, I'm actually lying on the talk about fractals. So this is the Julia, well, actually this is the Mandelbrot set. Um, zoomed in really far. Uh, I think it's really beautiful. Uh, yeah, fractals are cool. Um, what's interesting about this fractal, about fractals in general, is that they're, they're not very complicated to make. So this is the code to draw the Mandelbrot set in my favorite programming language, Julia. Uh, my second, sorry, my second favorite programming language, Julia. Um, if you are like in scientific computing, if you used NumPy, consider ditching that and using Julia instead because it's really great. Um, this is the same thing in NumPy. Uh, or here it is. Um, here's the code needed to draw the Mandelbrot set on a Commodore 64. Uh, it takes four and a half hours to run, but you can do it. Um, this is a uh, code to draw the Mandelbrot set in a language called BrainTech. Um, so like anything is possible if you, if you don't have uh, a life, um, the point here is that sort of like our demo, right? Like, I think the thing that sort of creeps people out a little bit about AI generated art is like, you didn't give it much input. You got these really beautiful images of Kermit the Frog, uh, maybe with too many eyes, but still recognizably Kermit the Frog. And all you had to do was type the sentence. Um, but I don't think that's strictly unique. Like all you have to do is write the equation for the Mandelbrot set. You can get beautiful images um, just through pretty simple computer programs. Um, this is another fractal I'm very fond of. Not quite as pretty, um, but very important. This is called fractal noise. Um, the way you make this generally is you take a whole bunch of layers of Perlin noise, which is just a lot of random vector dot product, basically. Um, and you multiply them by various coefficients and add them all up. And kaboo, you get these fuzzy cloud things. Um, and my favorite thing to do that with this, especially in high school, was imagine that it's like a height map, um, like a topographic map, and fill in all the low areas with water, fill in some like the middle areas with some sand and some forests and some uh, you know, fuzzy white mountain peaks. Um, and you've got yourself a really cruddy uh, real-time strategy game. Um, this is very common. If anyone thinks this looks familiar, there's good reason for that because everyone in their pet cat has done this. Um, you can even like use that to displace some actual 3D terrain, get kind of a 3D look. Um, you can even go one better and there's actually 3D fractal noise uh, where you're generating noise in the X, Y, and Z axes. You can vary the coefficients by altitude and just say, yeah, if uh, the noise is large enough in a given location, place a block, otherwise don't. Um, and if that looks familiar, uh, there's good reason because that's exactly how Minecraft works. I lied, I am gonna talk about Minecraft. Minecraft is basically just a lot of fractal noise in 3D. Um, you get to run around on it getting blown up by creepers. Um, that's obviously not the only thing that goes into Minecraft. Um, there's quite a lot of code in Minecraft to generate the terrain. Um, but my point is that like, there are literally quadrillions of different Minecraft worlds. And each one has the surface area of Neptune, roughly speaking. Um, if you were to build all that by hand, you, you would like not. Uh, 
So like the fact that just with a little bit of code, someone's able to build, build a quadrillion Neptunes is sort of impressive anyway. Um, there's also like trees and mushrooms and villages and boats and stuff. Um, in my practice, it's all pretty simple. They basically have a lot of hit statements. Um, but there's sort of a whole genre of games around these sorts of like procedural uh, towns. Oh, uh, Townscraper is my, sorry, Townscaper is my paper. Um, where's my Townscaper? Here we go. <clears throat> uh, oh, ooh, ooh. No demo is ever allowed to work perfectly. That would just be too disappointing. Oh, there we go. So Townscaper, this is running about five FPS on this computer. Um, geez, it really is running. Why is it running? I don't know why it's running so slowly. Anyway, the way Townscaper works, oh, oh my God. I may not be able to get this demo because it is just not working on this computer at all. Um, Okay, we'll see if I get a little, nope, not gonna work. Okay, I recommend you play Townscaper on your own time because it's a really fun game. Basically you just place blocks and then it follows rules. So I'm not deciding where to place roofs or where to place plants. I'm just saying, yeah, build a little bit of extra building here and it does. So like an example of this, if I completely fill an area in, um, Townscaper will decide to make it a bit of a park, right? So you see it plants some grass and some trees. If I remove that, um, They'll build some stairs, I guess. Well, so, yeah, so some stairs. If I make a tall, taller tower, if I make a taller tower, it'll make it all pointy on top. You get the gist. Um, so all it's doing is it has this list of rules. And for every combination of blocks you can place, it applies those rules to decide exactly what colors to make everything, and whether to put birds on top, and whether to make a little staircase and plant a tree. Um, and the specific algorithm it uses for this is called wave function collapse. Um, the rest of this talk is mostly about like 2D images because that's what we started with artwork or 2D artwork. Um, so in this case, rather than worrying about like walls and roofs and little pointy towers and potted plants, um, we're just worried about pixels and what color they should be. And it's the same algorithm. Hypothetically, that's the way this algorithm works is every pixel on the screen can be every possible color. You build a big wave function of all of those exponentially many possibilities. Um, and then via entanglement, you apply all the rules and then collapse the wave function and get a random image that is valid according to those rules. Um, no one ever actually implements it that way. That would be computationally insane. There's any physicist studying, uh, I don't know, anything could tell you. Um, really, it's just like solving a big Sudoku puzzle. Um, but the point is that from a relatively simple set of rules, you can make artwork automatically. What's different about this, though, versus the fractals or the Minecraft from earlier, is the fact that you can make one piece of art based on another piece of art you already have available. So imagine that I had some human artist, maybe some flower pixel art, uh, drew this on their computer and gave it to me, and I. I'm sad because I want more of it. So what could I do? What I could do is I could look at every three by three square of pixels in this image and write it down. So here I found a three by three square of pixels. That's sort of the end of the flower, the petals. Here's a little bit of stem. There's some three by three squares of pixels in here that are just empty blue. There's actually quite a lot of them. Oh, we've got two of these three by three square of pixels that are just a stem. And then what I can say is, okay, now make me a new image. You can make whatever random choices you want, but every three by three square of pixels in that new image has to be one of those combinations I already discovered. And boom, you get brand new art, whatever shape you want, just with that requirement that again, every three by three square in this output image follows those rules, is one of those that we already found. Obviously, this could never work on like more complicated images like photos, right? Because the relationships between the light and dark areas in this picture of my parents' cat um, are just too complicated, obviously, right? Right? Uh, actually, it turns out you can make this work. Um, but 
I got to qualify from this point on in the talk. I'm like massively simplifying. Um, I assume you do not want a tutorial. You don't want me up here like coding like six hours later. We get a no pointer exception, right? Like no, no, <laughs> not, not fun. Um, so this is all like spherical cow in a vacuum kind of stuff. I'm going to explain how all this works like a hypothetical universe where we have infinite data and infinite computing power. And we have like the platonic ideal of AI generated art. I mean, just know that I'm lying to you through my team. Um, so we're gonna use deep learning. What does deep learning means? mean? Uh, first off, it means you get uh, three times as much grant funding. Um, but the other thing it means is that you take a relatively simple statistical process, like search through this image looking for all the three by three pixel squares, um, and you just do it more times. Um, that's the deep part. Uh, so imagine I've got this like database of human faces, and I want to write some rules for what a human face is made of, so that I can, for example, find human faces in photos and focus my camera on them. Um, I assume your camera does this automatically these days. Um, so one thing I could do is I could look again, I could break these images down into little squares, decompose them into patterns. Um, in this case, eyes, is eyes and mouths and noses and teeth and ears. I just iterate over all the sort of patterns I see in those images and write rules for how those things are related. So generally you're gonna have eyes either side of a nose, nose above a mouth, below a forehead. Um, Ooh, losing my voice. Hopefully we can make it through the rest of this. Um, but in some sense, this hasn't solved the problem. This has just moved the problem down a level because there's no platonically ideal nose, right? Noses have almost as much sort of complexity and variability as faces do as a whole. So what do we do? We just do the same thing again because this is deep learning. We decompose our images of noses into sort of lines and gradients and open flat areas and circles and then decompose those further because we do it again it's deep learning into uh specific combinations of pixels there we go my slides got a little out of order um going back up again for example uh if we actually wanted to identify a face in the photo we could dig through the photo and figure out every little three by three square pixels in the photo which of these rules does it matter, match? Which of these patterns does it match? Based on that, we can then go through all of our rules for how those form lines and circles and gradients and figure out which of these are matched in the photo. We can then figure out what bits of the photo corresponds to eyes or noses or mouths. And once we have a map of where all those things are, we can apply our last set of rules and decide where in that photo a face might appear. So there's all these techniques for visually developed for life. Is your car at a stop sign, right? If you wonder why Google's asking you where the buses are in this photo, um, this is so that they can collect lots of data to turn into these sorts of rules for self-driving cars. Um, but hey, once we've got this set of rules, we should be able to create images of dogs, right? Just create, figure out all the rules for how the bits of a dog relate in an image and then apply the wave function collapse algorithm. Say, hey, every pixel in this image, just randomly select it, but make sure it follows the rules for how a dog should look. Make every pixel in this image as dog-like as possible. Um, and this works fantastically well. Uh, <laughs> this is called deep dream. This is what happened in 2015 when Google tried to use this as like an approach for debugging their neural networks, trying to understand what they thought a dog was. Um, the problem here, beyond the obvious, is that in real photos of dog, all the dog is sort of in one place. And in this case, there's just dog everywhere. Um, right, because we said make every pixel as dog-like as possible. It's like, okay, every pixel is part dog now. Um, right, this is my roommate's dog, obviously, or my own roommate's dog, it's not I have dog. Um, right, so in this picture, in the real picture dog, all the dog is like together. So that should be part of our rules for what constitutes an image of a dog. So what we gotta do is we gotta revisit how we created these rules. Um, originally, the way these sorts of rules are created is we're like, hey, write one set of rules that matches images of dogs better than images of cats. 
And another set of rules, the match of images of cats better than images of dogs, because we can discern which is in our photo. But what we really want, if we want to generate images of dogs, is create a set of rules that only matches dogs and then fails completely to match not dogs. What's a not dog? Um, this is a not dog, right? Our unholy abominations should be considered not dogs. The AI should set out not to make them um, so that we can sleep at night. Um, so, right, we take this and we say, hey, adjust the rules so that this is no longer considered a dog. Um, and very quickly, it figures out, oh, hey, if all the dog is everywhere, then it's a not dog. So I got to put all the dog in one place. So it gets better. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it arranges all the bits of dog correctly. Um, so we feed it through again. We say, hey, if the eyes are below the mouth, it's not a dog. And adjust the rules some more. Gets a little bit better. Gets at least the you know, facial structure correct. Um, some other things are still wrong now. So we keep repeating this process. Whatever the AI produces a dog, we say, you are wrong, that is not a dog. And force it to adjust its rules until eventually, you know, uh, the results are pretty much indistinguishable from reality. This is still a not dog. This dog does not exist. No human ever photographed that dog. But we as humans can no longer easily tell the difference between the not dogs and dogs, and thus our AI works pretty well. Um, if you want to see this in practice, you can go to thispersondoesnotexist.com and look at lots of pictures of humans that do not exist. They were created through this process by an AI called StyleGAN2. Um, StyleGAN2 was released in 2020. So this is just five years since um, Google did that terrifying deep dream image. Um, it can handle megapixel images, running thousands of pixels tall and wide. Um, and as before, right, when I was talking about the faces, we had those pretty basic layers of, right, rules for how pixels form lines, how lines form noses, how noses form faces. That's like three layers, right? Here, um, static on 2 uses 17 layers. And also, we're not using the wave function collapse algorithm at all anymore. Um, it's a nice, good, intuitive uh, understanding, like hypothetically, we could, but nobody does really. You create like two competing uh, combinations of rules for how to create images and then how to judge whether they are dogs or not dogs. Um, right, really, how all of this works is you just have a whole lot of linear algebra. Um, ooh, can I hide? Yeah, hide playing main controls. Um, right, so. In those 17 layers of rules, of patterns, we'd really like to be able to look at them and say, hey, like layer nine, it, it works on how rules for like wheels attached to cars or something, right? And, and provide a really decent explanation of what patterns are in that layer. Unfortunately, the way the process works now is we sort of distill all of those patterns into massive like million by million element transformation matrices via these algorithms called stochastic uh, uh, stochastic gradient descent algorithms. Um, uh, the classic example is like adaptive moment estimation. No one, even machine learning researchers don't always like keep track of how it all works. It's kind of overkill. But the point is like, it's just a lot of linear algebra. And if you ask like, hey, what are the patterns on layer nine doing? Uh, yeah, wouldn't we all love to know? <laughs> um, they are what they are because the stochastic gradient descent decided that any other combination of patterns it tried worked less well. And that's about the only explanation we get. So again, spherical cows in a vacuum. Um, ooh. Yeah. Okay, so that's just one way of putting massive amounts of linear algebra together to make images. Um, here's another one. This is one I'm particularly fond of called the diffusion model. Imagine I have just taken a picture of a book and it's dark out and I've got a crappy little cell phone camera and I've turned up the ISO way high. So it's like super, super grainy. Before I send this to my friends, I would like to clean it up and just make it look better. Uh, yeah, because I mean, who likes grainy images? Nobody. Um, so one way I could do this is I could take a little patch, a little square out of that image, like we've been doing the whole rest of this time, and go through the terabytes of images I found online 
and compare that little square to all the other little squares I've discovered. Find all the other squares that are most similar and average them together to get my new not noisy square. Um, this looks surprisingly well. Uh, you do this to a book. Oh, keep in mind, keep in mind, right? Like actually in practice, we are not averaging the literal pixels together because this is deep learning, right? We're extracting all these layers of different features and how much different patterns match at various levels of abstraction, right? But like, yeah, sure. In concept, we're averaging together bits of images we found online to try and approximate the original image we have. Um, so this is what sort of happens. One thing to notice is that the text is not readable, right? Like if I take a whole bunch of like letters that are vaguely like this letter and average them together, I'm not going to get like an actual letter. I'm going to get some alien looking BS that looks like you should be able to read it, but then you just can't quite read it. Um, I think this is, this is like if you use stable, because stable diffusion is diffusion model. You ask stable diffusion for text. Uh, you get nonsense like this, and I think it's fascinating that this is why. Um, the point here, though, is if I had some hypothetically perfect denoiser, if I had some hypothetically perfect AI to remove no brain from photos, it would not be able to get back the original photo. There is no CSI Miami zoom and enhance AI. They'll like uncover the license plate from some blurry garbage that's one pixel wide, right? Like it's just that's impossible from just information theory perspective. Um, so if you had this perfect AI that was going to remove film grain from an image that like clearly had no text visible, it would have to synthesize entirely new text to replace it. It would have to write its own book to put on that page so that there was plausible text to replace that text that was destroyed. And that proves that thought experiment, hypothetical thought experiment. No one ever built an AI that sophisticated and you could point with this. But that sort of thought experiment demonstrates that removing grain from an image is information synthesis, is creating information from scratch. So if we add more noise, we should have to create more information. That's exactly what happens. If I noise up this image a whole bunch more and then remove the grain again, I get a very different book. Like the overall structure of the image is the same, but it's got this nice blue binding now that's different. Um, it's kind of changed how the pages on the side are laid out. It's out of this bullet points for some reason, right? So it's a kind of an entirely different page structure because by noising the image even more, we gave it even more freedom as to what to put on that page. Um, and this is exactly, which then leads to the next question. What happens if you start with just pure 100% noise with no image there at all? Um, and that's what a drifting view model is. So this is exactly what stable diffusion does. It's a much simpler version where someone went to the internet and got thousands of pictures of flowers, but starting from just complete noise, taking those images of flowers that they collected, averaging them together until all the noise is gone, you can generate new images of flowers that you've never seen before. Um, as I said, this is exactly how stable diffusion works, um, except for the obvious missing question of like, how does it understand the text you gave it? Um, surprisingly though, this is actually not very complicated um, because when you're out there collecting images off the internet, most of them have some text nearby. Right, those images have captions, there's descriptions, um, the page has, I don't know, it's a blog, it's a recipe blog or something, right? Like there's just lots of text in addition to images. But when you're collecting those images, collect some text as well and keep track of the image text pairs that you found. Then just like our dog generation AI earlier, we can try and determine if the given text image pair is a real pair or if it's a pair we made by scrambling some other pairs together, right? Like was this text and this image actually found on a real website? Or did I take a random image and some random text that wasn't associated with them at all and stuck them together? Um, the point being that then you have basically a metric for how similar an image is to some given text. Um, again, Right, massively simplifying this is a bunch of crazy linear algebra. You don't care. The point is, we can, right, because like 
how, how do you write patterns for how text should be laid out in the syntax? It is a bit tricky, but you can do it, um, and this works surprisingly well. Um, and once you have that, that's all you need to make the diffusion model understand the text prompt you gave it. So what you can do, this is the table, my favorite image I've made with the table diffusion, by the way. Um, what you can do is the diffusion model, as it's picking images to average together, it can limit itself to only averaging together images that match the prompt you gave it based on that previously defined metric. So in this case, because it works on multiple layers, it's going to start out with a very noisy image. It's just working on the overall structure then, which is not going to find detail. Let's go look at the prepositional phrase again. We've got person on top of thing. It's going to pick kind of all the images it's got of person on top of thing and average them together and get some sort of big, massive person on top of thingness. It's going to refine that further. More noise is going to start to disappear. It's going to focus more on that word astronaut and on the word boat and on the word bread. And so it's going to start averaging to their only images of astronauts in that top portion that's most similar to an astronaut. And only images of boats in that lower portion that's similar to a boat, and only images of bread in the area of the bread. And eventually, as we work our way through, get rid of all the noise, it's going to start adding together just sort of pastry textures, fabric textures, wood grain, um, glowiness, um, until the end result is pretty darn good. Um, you should notice, though, that like it can't work backward. Like once it's picked, picked the overall structure, it can't be like, oh, well, the way I drew the astronaut, that structure doesn't quite make sense and go back again. Um, and that's why diffusion models tend to have trouble with like overall image composition. Like our earlier when we were doing the comment, Kermit the Frog in a courtroom photos. It just, it was like, oh, I've got Kermit the Frog. So I'm just going to take an entire image of Kermit the Frog and we would get along in the process and be like, oh, I didn't leave enough space for courtroom. Right, so that's for the limitation of these diffusion models. But we're working on it. Google's already got AIs that do a lot better job of that. Uh, we just don't have access to them yet. Um, right, remember, the circle count of vacuum. Uh, we're not literally averaging things together. It's not linear output. But I hope that gives you all a good impression of why these AIs are able to work. Like, I'm not interested to tell you exactly how they work, but hopefully you're like, okay, I can under I understand why it's possible for them to be able to do this. With that, I am leaving the technical portion of this talk. We're going to get into like the philosophy and legality of all this, uh, which is really hopefully the point of this presentation. And I've got 10 minutes. Um, I guess any other questions on the technical stuff before we move on? You can also ask at the end. Okay, so copyright. Um, I'm basing this all on chapter 300 and chapter 500 of like, copyright.gov's weird PDF things. Keep in mind, I am not a law student. Uh, I'm not even like, like my experience with the legal system is a podcast I listen to once in a while. Um, like, yeah, don't even, don't take this as legal advice, not just because that's me covering my ass, but like literally don't because I am making this up as I go. Um, yeah, fractals. Uh, so fractals, this is the equation for the Mandelbrot set. That equation is not copyrightable. Uh, equations aren't. Um, they're tools and methods and ideas. Um, but you don't need much creative expression for something to count as copyright. So if you take that, if you take that equation, you put it in some plotting software, the fact that you chose which equation to plot, you chose where to zoom into that equation, and you chose the beautiful color scheme to use. That's enough creative expression for the resulting screenshot to count as your, the product of your creative expressivity. Um, you'll have copyright on that screenshot. Uh, someone else could take the exact same screenshot and that'd be fine, but like just even that limited amount of creativity is considered enough by the legal system. Uh, Cause you know, Disney's lobbied the crap out of content. Um, video games, obviously much more complicated. Uh, but source code is considered a literary work. So Mojang holds the copyright on the Minecraft source code and the Minecraft program. Um, and uh, by extension, this is a little bit iffy, but generally if most of that creativity is then also expressed in the output of the program, the output of the program is considered under that same copyright. So the Minecraft terrain 
generated by that code is also Mojang's. It belongs to them. It's their, uh, it's a product of their, um, what's the word? I don't remember the word. There's a specific word, but it doesn't matter. Um, how have you been going to that world like build a building? Right, this is now composite work. You combine together Mojang's creative work and your creative work, but you have now transformed it. No one's going to look at this and be like, oh, yeah, this is a photo of a mountain. Right, no, it's a photo of a building. So even if some of the mountain that belongs to Mojang is in there, this is now your creative expression. Um, which then brings us to synthesized images. Synthesized images are a little ambiguous. Because on one hand, they're output from a soft piece of software like Minecraft. But also, you chose what image to make and the parameters for how to make it, like the fractal. But also, it is averaging together thousands of other people's images on the internet. So, is it a composite work? It's interesting. Um, in this case, this image here, I gave no input. I literally told Stable Fusion nothing, I just pressed the button. So I think in this case, we could rule me out as having copyright. Um, I also think we can probably rule out Stable Diffusion, the authors of Stable Diffusion itself as having copyright, because right, what they wrote is a bunch of linear algebra. And maybe the math majors in this room feel differently, but I don't think that creativity like comes through in this art specifically. So I would consider this a composite work of millions of people's images online, making it kind of public domain. Like it is transformed by the AI, it's no longer their art, but um, that transformation was not done by a human. And if your dog holds the camera in its mouth and takes a picture, no one has copyright on that. It's considered public domain. Um, however, you can put a lot of work into prompting the AI to give you something specific. This is an animation someone on Reddit made. They spent a lot of hours on this, finding just the right prompts and animating the result. And so I think in this case, they have put enough creative expression into the way they control the AI that it is really their art again. It's not the AI's art, and it's still a collage of all these images that got averaged together, but they have transformed those images into something new. Um, even though if you think, if you're a little bit like more on the conservative side of this, where you're like, hey, no, 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 if your art goes through an AI, it's not your art anymore. I refuse to acknowledge it. You've got a problem because like almost all 3D art on the internet has been through an AI. Um, the reason is demonstrated by this 3D model here. Someone made a cool attic in Blender and they rendered it out. And the computer is simulating how light bounces around in that attic. It's having a bad time when there's a bunch of smoke in that attic. To do those light sorts of simulations, we use Monte Carlo simulations. And in this case, there's a lot of error in the Monte Carlo simulation results in a lot of grain. You could let it run for three days straight and maybe all the grain would go away. But it's much easier to plug it into that diffusion model from earlier and all the grain goes away. Um, and in fact, this is what every 3D artist does. This is what Disney does. Before Frozen was on your TV, when it first came out of the 3D software Disney uses, it was terrible, it was noisy as heck. They put it through an AI to clean it up. They averaged together a whole lot of other people's artwork to make frozen less grainy. Um, that's just like a fact of how 3D art is made. So if you're, say, an art contest wants to add a rule like no art that's passed through an AI allowed in this contest, there's a lot of sort of ambiguity in how you enforce that. And I think it's very interesting. Um, here's another example. This is a photo I took of my laptop. Um, Interesting, right? I have copyright on this, even though I didn't even clap up because machines are copyrightable, design are copyrightable. Um, but in this case, right, it's been minimally denoised by my phone because, by the way, every app on your phone that takes pictures has AIs in it to remove grain from your photos. But we'll just pretend that it's not been through an AI yet. It's not had any denoising. I'm going to add 25% noise in the denoising. It's still kind of like the same image. But the keys are a little bit different. The rock texture is different. The screen has sort of different stuff on it because removing noise from an image, like I mentioned before, is a creative process. The machine is adding information to this. Image. But what about 50%? Now it's almost a completely different laptop. Um, still clearly the same image overall, though. So is it my image? Right? Is this my creative expression, even though the AI really screwed it up? 
How about this? How about 75%? Right now, it's a completely different laptop, completely different rocks, right? But it's still coming from my image that I took, the photo I took, just with a lot of noise. And we just talked about the fact that, like, removing noises from images is fine. People do it all the time. And so, what if I'm just removing all of the noise, just adding 100% noise and removing it all, right? So, at this point, clearly, this is no longer my work. The only reason it's still a red laptop on rocks is because that's what I told Stable Diffusion it was, right? Uh, I don't think I've put enough creative expression in this for it to count as my art. But the question is, how much prompting do you have to do? How far left do you have to move the slider before it's considered your art? Because a little bit of slider is already what everyone's doing to their photographs and to their 3D art. But then all the slider is somehow not your art anymore. And it's just like, it's, it's rare, I think, that you see these sorts of like moral gray zones where it's a literal slider. Um, just something to think about. Um, here's one last example before I get into the really philosophical shit, if I have time. Um, this is backpacking trip at the Rocky Mountain National Park this summer with my friend Robbie. Um, Journal Club wanted a photo to put on Facebook. And I decided, hey, since I was giving a talk on AI generated art, I should have some fun with this photo before I sent it to them. Um, so I put myself on Mars, <laughs> right? This is the real power of stable diffusion. Everything before now has been a janky tech demo. The real point of stable diffusion is that you can not just add noise to a photo you've already got, but add noise to specific places on a photo you've already got. I spent about two hours on this. Bits of this image have been denoised and renoised and denoised and renoised and denoised and renoised re re like dozens of times before I got something I'm happy with. Um, the rocks here are mostly real and mostly real, but some of the rocks aren't. The rock is obviously totally fake, but also so is the horizon. And I didn't do this entirely in stable diffusion. I started out with this, right? The really cool thing about stable diffusion is you can just paint, right? A really low quality version of what you want and the AI will help you fill it in. This is the long-term future of sort of art, right? Is like this Photoshop plugin someone made. Again, this is a tech demo, this is early days. But the point is, it's like a superpowered paintbrush. You can vaguely fill in details, press a button and the AI will interact with you. It'll fill in details that you're missing. It will sort of team up with you as the artist to create bits of your image and tie bits together. Um, I think this is really cool. Like I said, the, the version of diffusion models of Dolly 2 where you just put some text into a web page and a finished image is cut out, that is not the future. This is not the future either. But the future is going to be a lot more like this when it's interactive. Um, yeah, pretty cool, right? Um, so philosophy, more philosophy time than the like five minutes I've got left. Um, I work on all this. So by the way, my research topic isn't actually AI generated art. I mostly work on like scanning real world things so we can put them inside the computer. Um, but the reason I work on that and the reason I work on AI technology is because I want to use it to empower more awesome people to do more awesome like things. That's the way I see it. The more awesomeness in the world, the better. But like technology is not morally neutral. It's not free of moral content. Um, and this technology is no different. So everything I just showed in this presentation, all the stuff about finding rules, writing rules as to where people's faces appear in photos, you know, that's being used. In China right now, they're using it to identify Uyghur Muslims in security camera footage and send them off to concentration camps, right? That is not okay. If this was how we thought this technology was going to be used, when people were working on in 2015, I think they would be a lot more hesitant to have pursued it in the direction it was pursued, right? We would have been a lot more cautious. Um, this is a little bit of a less serious version example, but also like, what the fuck? <laughs> um, this was NVIDIA. NVIDIA published this. They said, hey, we can just use, why don't we just use StyleGAN2 to upscale people, pictures of people's faces, to increase res their resolution. 
Um, and they released this, said, hey, we've done an awesome thing. We're going to plug, plug the image of Obama into it. And it made it into a frat form. So like, um, part of me wants to just say this is a technical issue, like, like ignoring any sort of bias. Um, like obviously it's just not a good upscaling of the original, it's just by objective criteria. So in some sense, this is a bug. Also, this AI was mostly trained on pictures of celebrities because they're easy to get rights to. That obviously biases the results. But also this is just racist because if there were any black people working at NVIDIA, they would have plugged their own faces into this AI and gone like, guess we're going back to the drawing boy, uh, board boys. Um, like we just would have never seen the light of day. So, right, we need to be better about considering like who these AIs are empowering. Um, make sure they're empowering to everybody and not just uh, frat boys in the Chinese government. Um, and th like, like the industries are not unaware of this fact. So OpenAI has this policy. Originally, they were founded to be open, to take all of their machine learning models and release them for everybody. And then when they released Dolly 2, they decided they weren't going to do that. Anymore. Instead, they were going to prescribe onto their users the way in which they use that model. They were like, yeah, if you try and upload pictures that we don't approve of, or prompts we do not approve of, we will ignore them. We will not help you, uh, I don't know, make nude photos, for example, right? So if you try and upload a picture of Trump to Dolly 2, which is open and small, it'll just reject you um, because it thinks, hey, making fun of politicians uh, is not morally acceptable. Um, but recreating the styles of dead artists, that is just fine. Um, now, I don't think necessarily there's any problem recreating the styles of dead arts just for fun. Like if you're just enjoying seeing a robot in a Monet point painting, go for it, right? But OpenAI is a company. They are releasing the software explicitly for people to make money with it. And so, right, I do not necessarily want to treat them as the like ultimate determiner of morality, right? And decide what are moral uses of this technology and what aren't. Um, I, I personally find that deeply uncomfortable. Um, so this kind of comes down to like, uh, ooh, I missed a slide here. Whatever, we'll look at robots on the seesaw. The point of this is that um, in my eyes, AI and automation in general and computers in general, right, force multiply. They allow you to do amazing things like, like create very complex works of art and huge Neptune-sized planets full of trees with relatively little work on your part. And we as a country, I think, find this kind of unsettling, unsettling because we are sort of obsessed with this idea that like, you can't get stuff for free, right? Like you should do an amount of work proportional to the credit you're given. Um, that uh, not doing much work and then having good things happen to you is like, you're lazy and you, you're bad and you should feel bad. Um, and the problem is that with AI, with automation, we're heading into this post-scarcity world where everyone can just have a lot of cool stuff without having to work on that. Um, I personally think that's a great thing. Like I want to empower more people to do more awesome things. But we have to keep in mind that like A, that means more awesome things with less work. And right, requiring people to work hard may not be like a viable way of running our economy in the future, A. And two, if you make everyone more powerful, that also means making bad people more powerful. And we're gonna have to square with that. Like, uh, I don't know why I have the Julia Mandelbrot set in there, it's pretty. Um, anyway, so my sort of last three ideas here are one, I think public discussion on all this needs to happen, which is why I'm giving this talk. I want people to have interacted with this technology and really have an informed viewpoint about how they feel about it. Um, I personally think model parameters and training procedures should be open source. I don't like stable fusion and Google just sitting on these and keeping them for themselves. Um, maybe this is naive of me, but the way I see it, um, if everyone in the world has access to technology and is empowered, eventually like the good guys will win. Like uh, bad actors are a relative minority. And so the real danger is having the very powerful people um, have exclusive access to this technology. 
Um, and three, right, this is the really easy one. We need to rethink our economy, right? We are heading barreling into this post-scarcity world where like working hard is just no longer a moral good, where you can be empowered either way. Um, and so I think we need to think a lot about, about a lot about how um, it doesn't matter so much the amount of work you choose to do, but what work you choose to do. And with that, question time. I welcome, I welcome all top takes hot or cold. That was, Go for uh, massively inspiring. Unfortunately, we have one minute left. I'm so good. <laughs> I saw you had your hand up first. Uh, we just don't have time. Oh, we just don't have time. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Okay, two questions. So, like, you mentioned about fish hogs, rhinoceros, and uh, now they can know that the last part of uh, like modern artist community is very evident about the eye art was stating that their art is being used mm -hmm. for these uh, like new uh, like period pictures, even though like, when they exist, the art is not used. So is there a way, for example, not to use the art of artists that expressly say that they don't the art to be used when you for example, a teacher program or when you ask the program to generate a teacher? Yes, um, I think we should probably have some sort of system where when you upload something to the internet, you can mark it as not for robots. Um, we do not currently have that. And so the companies that build these models consider that license to scrape everyone's artwork. Um, the other side of that is that stable diffusion it makes its best results when you specify a specific art style that you copy. Um, in some sense, I think that's a technical limitation, but that's also an issue, right? Like if you can only get good results by copying someone specific, then regardless of what training data you used, I think you need to rethink to some extent how that system works, especially before you use it for profit. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so yeah. when you were talking about like your second point in the final slide about mm -hmm. that parameters of the model should yeah. be open source, but then going back earlier, talking about like the deeper an AI goes adversarially against itself, these rules are kind of being made up that we don't understand. Like we don't oh, yeah. necessarily know on level nine not go. what choice it is way to come back. Uh, but like how did it make that decision? Like even the people who told it to figure it out aren't really sure. So even if something is made open source, let's say, um, it can still, I think we're all kind of still looking at a black box, right? Mm -hmm. And you kind of need the superpower technology to be able to run these computational models, right? So even if you said, hey, here's the trillion lines of code I did to make this, do what you want with that, is that still open source the way we understand it to be accessible to like a democratic level? Um, no, you're absolutely right in the sense that making a lot of open source, I do not think makes it more interpretable. But like, to some extent, I also think uh, interpretability, like we had this phase of civilization with things like interpretability, right? Where we had computer programs that worked in simple, understandable ways. Before that, we had to deal exclusively with humans. And who knows why humans do things? And now we're going into an age where we have AI, and who knows why AI do this thing? So in some sense, like interpretation is not to me the key issue. The key issue there is, right, making Barack Obama like Right, like there are all these proprietary AIs that run things like search through your email, that decide uh, how much plane tickets should cost you, that decide how much health care you should receive. Right, and if those are completely hidden behind the scenes, if we don't know how they were trained, then we cannot validate them independently. We don't know that they're not racist, for example. Right, so to me, it's important that these be open source. First off, because they're made with hard data, right? Like the bulk of Stable diffusion is other people's data. It's like a couple kilobytes of code and 14 gigabytes of model parameters distilled from the internet's photos. So first of all, I already think it's like your model collectively. But also, like if you don't have access to it, uh, how can you trust it? Like you can't validate on it, you don't know what it's doing. Um, so that's sort of why I think that's useful, not just to make it more interpretable. So, well, if you have any other questions for Sam, I'm sure you'll um, 
but um, I think they're not. 